It is a joy and a privilege for me to be here for the first time. And uh, I would like to bring the love and greetings from the saints that gather on Dr. Felix Street in Bucharest. Um, I almost said I like very much this room because I haven't seen that uh, clock over there when I entered, but now I see it. So I'm not very pleased, but still, we're not good friends. That's why I'm saying that. I, I am in a very weird uh, situation right now because usually when Brother Brian Reynolds is in the same room with me, usually we are next to each other. So I'm a bit confused because he's sitting there and I have to be by myself. But I trust the Lord will uh, give me uh, a simple and clear message as he has usually uh, to be put uh, to heart by everyone. I'm sure that the Lord Jesus has something to say to each one of us. And I was encouraged by the prayer, young and old, for everyone, for his glory. So I would like to read, first of all, three portions, short portions of the Word of God. First of all, I would like to open in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 3, where I'll read only one expression. Revelation chapter 3, the beginning of verse 12, only that, three words, him that overcomer. Second epistle of Peter, chapter 2. Second Peter, chapter 2. Verse 19, at the end of the verse, I'll read again just a short portion. The man is overcome. And in the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, Daniel chapter 1, I will read the first seven verses, Daniel chapter one, from verse one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessel of the house, vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shina, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessel, the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes. Children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans and the king appointing them the daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now, among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave them unto Daniel, the name of Belshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of uh, Abednego. Probably you asking yourself, yourselves, what is the connection between the three passages that I have read? You immediately saw the overcomer, Revelation 3. Then in 2 Peter 3, the opposite of an overcomer is a person who's overcomes someone who is defeated. 
And now the question is, what do you need to overcome? And what can you be defeated by? And um, one verse from 1 Timothy chapter 6 comes to my mind, where there is an expression, the man of God. An expression that appears usually in a time of general decline. It's always in singular, and it's always in times of decline, where the majority of people who confess to have an external relationship with God are in bankruptcy. So that means practically that Christians are divided in two groups. I can't say which one is bigger, but there are Christians who are overcome by the general conditions of weakness. And Peter, Paul tells us in his second episode, in chapter three, that the last times will be such times where the general conditions, not in the hidden world, but in what we call the Christendom, the general state is one of weakness that has the tendency to influence everyone. And this is the general state that is pressing. In these kind of moments, though, God does not let himself without weaknesses. And there are people that, by his grace, are capable to overcome the general state of weakness and are able to give a strong and bright testimony despite the general state. And that is why I brought before us, and it is my desire to bring before us Daniel. And my exercise is, in the time I have uh, ahead of me, I understood very clearly what Brother Derek says. I have to stop at five o'clock. It's there. Andre turned to me and said, uh, do you have a watch? I said, no, I don't. But I have a phone, so I'll check that. And if I, you see I'm going over time, you'll help me. But my exercise is to see a bit what this uh, illustration in the book of Daniel can bring to us relevant in the year 2024. Obviously, I will not hide the fact that the what is on my heart is addressed especially for young people. And I'm glad to see young people of all ages here in the room. So the passage is here for young people, but I'm sure that the Lord will give something for each one of us. Because uh, we all know the book of Daniel is one of my favorite books in the Old Testament. And we have this passage that I read where this foreign king, mighty king Nebuchadnezzar, came to Jerusalem, the city of the living God, and overtook it and gave, he gave the king in the hands of this foreign idolatrous king with an entire young generation that was moved from their country into a different country. And my exercise is also to be to make all of us aware of something that sometimes escapes our mind. That is, we all, without exception, young and old, are in a spiritual conflict. We are in a spiritual conflict. And my one of my arguments is in Ephesians chapter 6. I would like to read that verse just to justify what I just said, there is a spiritual conflict in which all believers are involved, regardless of the fact they realize it or not. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, that's the only verse I'm going to read. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles or against the strategies or against the military tactics of the devil. So I understand from this verse that the enemy of our soul, that the Lord Jesus Christ, our beloved savior defeated at the cross and he will never be able to bring us back in our last condition. 
we are forever assured in the hands, blessed hands of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. However, I read and I understand from here that he has strategies in order to spoil the life of the believers. That is to make them in a certain degree, if he can do that in an entire degree, unuseful for the glory of God. And the question raises, can it be true that a person who has the Holy Spirit, a person who's a beloved child of God, can live a life that at the end can be marked by one more, unuseful for the glory of God in time. And we will see together, I hope, with the help of the Lord, that in the plan of this scheme against this generation, we can see revealed in the word of God the strategies of our enemy that he has in mind for every single one of us. The Apostle Paul, if I'm not wrong, in the second epistle of, um, of himself to the Corinthians in chapter 2, at the beginning of the chapter, he says, we are not aware. Actually, we are aware. That's what Paul says of his devices. But my experience, maybe I wrong, is that the majority or a big part of the believers are unaware of these wiles, of these strategies of the enemy of our soul against them. Although Paul says, we are not aware. We, we, we are aware, actually, uh, of his plans. He, he, he writes that to the Corinthians. The question is, now for each one of us, and for me, am I aware from the word of God of the way he works? A very good uh, friend of mine, uh, uh, Father in Christ, he, he, many times he has advised me. He, he said, I'm in different exercises when difficult things happen in a local assembly or on the mission field. And he said, my only aim is, he told me this, to see the enemy, where does he come from? And as soon as, soon as I see where he comes from, then I'm aware. Then I know what to pray. Because I'm aware that how he comes to destroy a world, to destroy a local assembly, to touch someone's life. So um, I would like that the Holy Spirit will maybe bring fresh to us this reality. We are in a spiritual conflict, although we realize it or not. And we have to realize two important things. In our own strength, we have no chance against the enemy. That's number one. In this conflict, in my own strength, in my own natural ability, I have no chance. I will be defeated. But then the good news is that the one who is in us, John tells us that in his first epistle, chapter 4, is bigger than the one that is in the world. So in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and John says then his first epistle in chapter 2, that there are young men in faith who had overcome who? the devil, through knowing the word of God. And many young people, and not only them, are defeated by the enemy because they do not know very well and do not appreciate what God has written for us in his blessed word. So in myself, I have no strength. In the Lord Jesus Christ, I have all the strength to win in this uh, conflict to winning this conflict. Although when you think sometimes, you say, the Lord says, flee, for example, he says, flee the last, flee fornication. And then when he's about the difference, he says, resist the devil, confront, stay there, don't, don't, don't fly, don't flee away. In, in my own mind, I would say, no, uh, uh, I'll run away from him and, and face easier than temptation. And the Lord says, no, you feel the temptation, you feel the loss, and you resist him. This is what the word of God tells us. And now, we, now, who is this king, Nebuchadnezzar? He's a very clear picture of Satan in two aspects. 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, Satan is called the God of this age. That means he's the initiator, he's the originator of all fake religions that are in this world, regardless of their name. He's the God of all fake religions, the originator, the father. But then in the Gospel of John, for example, in chapter 14, he's called the prince of this world. So he's in two qualities. One he is direct through all spiritual, religious, fake activity. And the second thing he runs as the prince of this world, what we can call the secular activities, all the politics of this world is in his hand. He runs it. These are two aspects in which this king is a very clear image. That's what I said, that in him we can see the enemy of our soul. And we can see also how he, and we will see, I will take them one other time, as the time allows, we will see at least six things that he tried to do, that he tried to change in the life of these young people, and they make a spiritual application for our lives. What did he do? First step. He changed, he changed their face physically. He took them from the promised land, what was their inheritance, obviously earthly inheritance, and moved them physically in another place. And we have in verse two, a certain name, Shina. Shina. And um, first of all, okay, they they had a material inheritance. We don't have them. As we have heard at the conference, I think every day, we have spiritual blessings. It's our inheritance. So the question is, okay, I don't have a material inheritance. How can he, he move them from a place to another one in order that they will not be able to enjoy the land in which they have, as the scripture says, milk and honey. How can he do that with me or with each one of us? How can he make it possible that he deprives me of my spiritual blessings, of what is that I have in Christ? And the answer is, now I come back to Shinar, Shinar means to throw away, to have no restrictions. It's basically to do whatever you like. The, the place of complete freedom. And a lot of people are deceived by this. And maybe someone says, oh, freedom is something wonderful. Yes, if it's in Christ. If it's in Christ, it's wonderful. But we live times in which, in the Christendom we live in, everyone is doing according to his own will. The so-called restrictions, divine restrictions of the scripture that protect us and makes us enjoy these blessings are pushed away, especially in the mind of the young and not only in, the, in their mind. We have to, probably you heard this, what our parents practice is outdated. It's too narrow. It's too narrow. Now, there is a generation that seeks to put away what they call outdated without knowing what the spiritual blessings are and to do what? To do whatever comes into their minds, maybe positive things, but that have nothing to do with the scripture. So his, his goal is this, to make me, to rob me of the joy that I can have in my spiritual inheritance. And you know what the consequence is? I will start trying to find joy because if I don't have joy in my spiritual blessings in Christ, my heart will crave for something and I will start looking for delight or for pleasure or for joy in what? In other things 
which the unbelieving people of this world are looking to find joy in. That means when they look at me and see me in competition in the worldly things with them, I'll be no testimony to them. They will see nothing of the joy that Christ gives me. Despite the fact I might be a genuine child of So if I'm seeking joy and pleasure in the worldly things, together with people who don't know Christ, how are they going to see that he can give a joy that has nothing to do with what is on this earth, which is limited, which doesn't really, really bring accomplishment, which makes me no different than that. So this is step one that he did to seek satisfaction in things that this world seeks satisfaction in. Basically, to make them look, live for things that are at this level. Nothing to do with divine things. Nothing to do with Christ. Nothing to do with divine delight in what the earthly man cannot see, cannot taste. So this is step number one. He changed their place. The second thing we see in verse three, it says here, there is a, there is a verse. Um, the king spoke with Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs. And this is the second thing that he wants to do. He wants to change the young man. And I, I'll read in a second a verse from my dad. He wants to change the young man in Yunus. Isaiah, and I would like to, I like to go to Isaiah, if I'm not wrong, chapter 39, where there is a verse he prophesied about this, that this king will bring the young men in his palace and will make them Yunus. 39 verse 7. And of thy sons, Isaiah 39, verse 7, and of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they, that is this young man, shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now, what is a eunuch? Physically, these young people were, were castrated so that there will be no one coming out in the next generation, so that no potential leader will come against the king. Now, the question is, from the spiritual point of view, how we see what exactly does he have to do with us? And especially with the young people. We are called, and this is something important, to bring fruit for God. To bring fruit for God. And his aim is that in the in the young generation, there will be there will be no fruit for God. You see, and it's very important. You see, he didn't say take all the young people. He's his first aim was that in that generation, he goes for what was the best. The best. Physically, handsome. Intellectually, very sharp. Academically, very educated. Great potential. Ever is of great potential and can make advance not the king of Babylon, but the king of heaven is an, in the direct attention of the enemy. And the question why? Especially because this kind of young people can be really useful 
for the advancement of the kingdom. And many, again, again this is my observation. I'm not gonna say many, quite a lot, quite a lot. I don't wanna be that extreme, quite a lot. Young people that I know, at least in my country, top universities, top in their companies, are in a way deceived to live lives for what is passing. Yes, they come to the meeting. Yes, they are present on Sunday, rarely on Tuesday night when there is prayer meeting. But the question is, can, be, can they be of use for the local testimony? Can they be used by the Holy Spirit in the worship and adoration that should be brought to the Lord Jesus? And the sad answer is that many, many times the answer is no. Why? All their energy, all their abilities are channelized, are consumed in their workplaces. Noble thing. I'm not saying that we should not go to work. But you see, one thing is to work, and I'm not saying that we should be lazy, we should skip uh, classes, we should be poor employees or no. The, the question is for, and now for everyone, is, is my entire energy consumed and all capacities that the Lord Jesus Christ gave me are consumed for the advancement of what is material in this world? Am I, and I have to tell you, to confess, I was such a young person. I'm not saying I was that skilled, but that I would come every Sunday and be, excuse my language, just a piece of furniture. Exactly like the chair in that room. The chair was there, I was there. That was it. Present, tired, many times not able to focus. Absolutely no use. And again, this is the strategy. The best should advance the world. No, the best should have this in mind. Christ has saved us that we live lives that will glorify him and will make the kingdom advance soul by soul. And we could see here how, how this king wanted them to have no foot, no followers. And we know the prayers of the Apostle Paul, how he prayed many times that the believer will bring fruit. First of all, the fruit is the character of Christ displayed in our lives. And why not? Also, the things that we can do for the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, the edification of the saints, everything. So the question is right now, am I living a fruitful life? Because this is the, the Lord Jesus Christ gave us his resurrection life, his exact resurrection life. The Holy Spirit, the divine person dwells in us. We have the Holy Word of God. We have everything at our disposal. The question is, how much fruit is in my life? I enjoyed very much the, the garden. And so green, so full of fruit. And imagine how does our life look? Like the garden, right here in front of the meeting wall, green flowers, fruit, or from the spiritual point of view, maybe a deserted place. There is not much of the Lord Jesus Christ. A question that we should ask, all ask ourselves. The third thing, not only he changed their place, not only he changed um, them in eunuchs, the third thing he wanted to change the goal of their existence. At the end of this schooling, the king said that was his purpose. They have to be my servants. They have to be able to serve me. What is the... I have asked this question to a group of 14 young men, 12 to 15, in a camp in Romania. One morning I said, listen boys, have you ever asked yourselves this question? What is the purpose I am born on this earth? Immediately all of them said, yes, 
I said, I have my full resignation. And then I asked them again, did you find the answer? In the same speed, all of them said, no. I said, I have a good news for you. I know a little verse. He's not the only one. In the epistle of Colossians, in chapter one, if I'm not wrong, at the end of verse 17, uh, let's go, uh, let's go and read it. Because every time you record it, you have to be very careful. Colossians chapter one. Yes, verse 17. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. And the end of verse 16 says, all things were created by him. And now that this is very important. And for him. This is the answer to this fundamental question that one person should ask himself. Why do I exist? Why is my heart beating? Why did I appear in time? And look at this wonderful answer. For him. For him who? For Christ. The purpose of one's existence is accomplished only in relation to this person. And God, and I want to read the verse in Isaiah 43 to see Another verse, wonderful verse, Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, verse 21. These people, he's talking about his earthly people. These people have I formed for myself, the same meaning is in Colossians. And now, they shall show forth my praise. My life and everyone else's life will find its full accomplishment if it's lived for the glory of God. If in the way I live my life here in relation with his son, and what a blessing to be born in a family with believing parents. What a blessing that I have ignored and despised for many years. What a blessing to have, to have the gospel before you every Sunday, every week. But what a blessing when through hearing the gospel, you have a moment where you come and confess your sins. What a blessing to see in Christ the one who took your punishment on the cross. And what a blessing to be born again. What a blessing to say, I not only have believing parents, I have my own relationship with Christ. Finally, I understood what they meant. What a blessing. And not only that, he's my savior. And many, many believers, unfortunately, are just satisfied. I got my ticket for heaven. I'm saying, my sins are forgiven. And that's all. I cross the border. No. The Lord Jesus Christ wants us to move away from the border, to progress in his knowledge, and to live lives that glorify him. Now, the next thing that this king wanted for, for them was to change their language. Education. I mean, he said, I don't want to hear any Hebrew on the streets of Babylon. No Hebrew. Why? Because that will identify them as a foreign, as a stranger to that culture. That will be a, a clear manifestation of their origin. So now, is the enemy, does he want to change the way we speak? And I would say that there is an influence from the world that has, I would suggest, one feature. One strong feature 
that the language of this world is trying to be put in the mind and heart of a young generation. You know what that feature is? Lack of respect to authority. What kind of uh, authority? Parents? I, I have to confess, sometimes I was, not, I was not respectful, okay, to my mom. I, I was scared of my dad. God bless his son. But my mom said this. I don't know what the situation is with you, but the, the, that's the first mark of the language of the world. Respect to authority. Parents, okay, I'm very polite with my parents, but I I'm a different person. Mentions are nothing for me. I hope there is no one here. I know there is no one here like this. I'm not a prophet. I'm not a prophet, but I know. But this is the mark of the law, the way this one speaks. How is that language put in the head of the young generation? Music, movies, you call it. Everything is putting this mark. Look at this way. Not only lack of respect towards the parents, not only lack of respect to the teachers. Now we come to the assembly life, and it would be a tragedy and a sad thing that the language of the young generation will show lack of respect to the spiritual families, parents, brothers and sisters. Yeah. The Apostle Paul has a verse which I would like to read in his epistle to Ephesians. How should we speak? We know this verse, chapter 4. I would just write, like to read this verse. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse. See, I was in a right place. I'm not very used with my English Bible, but. It's good practice. 29. 29. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that he may minister grace unto the hearers. We have a wonderful example in our beloved Lord Jesus. When he spoke, People, the people who were his enemies, they were sent to arrest him. They came back and they said, what did they say? We have never heard a man speak like him. We have never heard a man speak like him. If I spend time with him and I learn his language and it comes in my heart, there will be evidence of that. And that is a strong testimony. Maybe we don't think like that in the way we speak. You see, these things wanted their... Hebrew language to disappear. And this is what the enemy wants. He doesn't want young people or believers who speak differently, who, who have a different way of communicating, where you can see grace, where you can see the beauty of the language of the scripture. But he spoke like that. So if we spend time with him, we'll learn his language and we'll speak like him. The fifth, the, the, the fifth thing he changed, and I'm approaching the end of that, is that he changed their food. He changed their food. We, we have read. He didn't say, I'll give you, I'll give you the food of, uh, of my servants. I'll give you a good food. He said, no, I'm going to give you exactly my food. My meat and my wife. Probably, not probably, the best food that one can find. And we have to understand something. This was a test for an entire generation. Imagine you are, you are a prisoner of war, and suddenly there is this offer. Listen, best university ever, scholarship. You don't have to pay anything. Best professors, not only that, not only you don't have to pay for your lodging, best food, best food. The meat and the wine. Is it something wrong? And basically, this book was written because one young man said, "Speak from this minor thing, I will not eat this food. 
You see, sometimes we, we think that we should do you know, great things, we should be faithful in, in some important things. No, we should be faithful and we should pay attention to what? Things. Everything started with food. This book was written because of a young man who said, I have purpose in my heart. Verse 8. Do not eat his food. What? The best food of the moon. Obviously, his situation is not our situation. We have heard that the compass. However, there is a spiritual input that we can take from here. The enemy of our souls, the devil, has food, spiritual food for the people of this world. In, I've seen it in London also, not only in Bucharest. In every station we have been at, in the subway, wherever you go, you see people eating, eating, sitting. Music, movies, sports, books, you call it. There is a hunger in the soul of men who are not satisfied with this food, but they continue to eat it every day. And this is what the enemy wants. Because I don't know if uh, there is this uh, saying in English, you are what you eat. You are what we eat. I mean, visibly, visibly, this can be seen. How much we eat, how little we eat, everything is visible in our bodies. However, not only in our bodies. You know, I speak with young people and they say, you know, I don't have the desire to read the word of God. Really? Good. I mean, it's not good. Tell me more. I don't have the desire to go to the meetings. I don't have the desire to pray. And, and my question is, what is your diet? Very healthy. I go to the gym. I only eat a type of fish. I only... He said, no, 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 no. Tell me your spiritual diet. What do you eat? You know, I heard of, a, of a, someone was left with his younger brothers and sisters before parents came for dinner. And they were hungry and he didn't know what to give. And he just gave them, you know, chips, sweets, all kind of desserts. And they all ate for like half an hour. Parents came home, dinner for everyone. What happens? Children sit at the table. They don't touch anything. They've been already satisfied, excuse my language, with junk. So this is the problem. When I eat the junk, this is how it's called. It's junk, has nothing to nourish my new nature. Whatever this world gives at its best and most noble levels does not feed my new nature. My new nature, and not only mine, every single believer's new nature feeds only on one type of food, and that is ice in the globe. So if I eat chips, if I eat Candies, if I drink all kinds of sodas, I'll have no appetite for divine things. I think I'm understood in what has little chips, yeah? Whatever this world can give. And my appetite for divine things will be so low. I'll have no interest. You cannot feed yourself from the junk of the world, excuse my language, and then go to the divine things and say, oh, wow, I'm enjoying both. No, that's impossible. If you are into what the world can do, unfortunately, you say, boring, difficult, unappealing. And the reality is that what satisfies the soul is the food Christ gives, not what the enemy of our soul. Although we may look so good. These young men refused. They said, and they have the scripture. No. And they didn't do it in an arrogant, aggressive way. Daniel said, can I please have um, vegetables and some water? He, he was very polite. Because sometimes you, you can have good motivations, but express it in a wrong way. But he was so kind, so gentle. That man was afraid 
And he said, put us to test. 10 days. You know, we hear the brothers say 10 is the number of tests. This is one example. Why 10 is the number of tests? 10 days. 10 fingers. Yeah? Put us to test. What was the result of those 10 days of uh, vegetables and water? What would be the result? You see, not a long period of time. And I, I make a bracket. You see, this education process is not instant that the devil wants to influence the young generation. He says three years. It's a slow process that takes a while and something very important. And this is, I think, demonic. Takes away the children from their parents. That's very important. Why? Because he knows that the parents are a good influence for them. And unfortunately, they can be young people under the same roof with their parents. And unfortunately, be very far away from each other. And this is the enemy's work. I will take the young generation, I will take these young people out of the positive spiritual influence of their parents. Why? So I can educate, so I can influence, so I can destroy their lives. And this is what happens. What was the result of those 10 days? Their faces were different. This had an impact. If we feed on Christ, if we feed on Christ, it will be seen. Well, my, my face will shine. If we share Christ, the Lord Jesus says, blessed are you when people will speak evil of you because why? Because you give testimony. I remember Brother, brother Brian inspires them. He said, and this is the reality. He says, when I come to meetings, talking about faces. When I look at people's face, and I, I almost, and I, this is coming back to my mind every time I'm in a, in a meeting and you look at the, the faces and, and Brother Brian says, I want, I want to ask them a question. Have you eaten lemon before you came to the meeting? <laughs> when you enjoy Christ, my face, when I enjoy Christ, my face is not going to look like I just eaten a, three lemons, you know. I'm so pious. No, I'm not. Moses fails, sure. And it will be visible that the fruit will reflect in our testimony to the others. My friend. And now the 16, he changed their names. He changed their name. In scripture, the name equals the identity of the person. They have to be put away their Hebrew names because it would be wrong to walk in the street of Babylon, confusion where every, everything is right and to have a name like Daniel, which, mean, which is God is judge or God is my judge. Well, judge? You know, no, God will not judge anyone. Everyone is right. Every religion will take you to heaven. And here you need someone who wears a name who says, no, there is only one God, and that only God will judge everyone who is not according to his divine standard. That is unacceptable. Change of name. We have an identity. Now, coming to us. We have an identity which the world is putting pressure on us to hide. I'll give you an example. There was a disciple in the New Testament. And at one point in his life, only two people knew he's a disciple. Himself? Okay, I should say two persons. And God. I just had a discussion with some young people from my family. And I asked them, you know, they are in the high school years, 17, 18. I said, oh, I have them Christian. Do, do people in your class know you are Christian? Silence. One of them, who always have good, has good answers, came up with another one, like kind of a Peter, you know, who says, no one asked me. It's good. That's good. You know, Joseph from Arimathea was a hidden disciple of Christ, but until one point, until he has seen the cross and the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and the sufferings he endured, because he loved Joseph. And I think 
that one reason why I'm, I'm ashamed sometimes to testify of Christ is because I'm not enjoying that life. I'm not seeing that sacrifice. I, I don't meditate too much upon his sacrifices. Because when you look at the cross and you understand how much he endured, and then you are called in your environment, smaller or bigger, to say, this is the man that saved me. He took the punishment for me. I will not be ashamed. And Joseph had a moment where he came out publicly, which meant for him maybe exclusion from the society he will live in. Rich man, he said, I want the body of Christ. I want to identify myself with my Savior in his death. I want to testify to him. Peter was ashamed to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ because he trusted in himself. But there was a moment where after he learned his lesson, he had thousands of people and he was not afraid to call them what they were. And the Lord used them. We will be used, each one of us, in our circumstances. But we need one thing. Am I available? Do I want to say something about my own? To the people around me, which I know that without his knowledge, they will perish. They will perish. The devil wants our identity hidden. He doesn't want us to shine. He doesn't want us to speak of Christ. I have arrived at, at, at the end, and uh, yes, these are six things that you can find. Just I would like just to mention to mention in closing that. Daniel, his number one feature. How was he able to live in that time? Apparently to change or to live during the um, authority of four emperors and able, and if we read the book, able to give such a testimony in a world that was all against God, not with presidents, but with cruel kings that would send it to death. And he was able. And his first move, he said, I want to keep myself undefined by the world. A clear cut. That was his first desire. He purposed in his heart. I do not want to be defined by what this world can give me. And then the next thing, he had good friends. He looked for good friends. And that's also important. I can be useful if I separate myself from what is the negative things of this world. But that's not sufficient. He had friends. He poured this out together with them. And not only that, he himself spent time in prayer and in the world of God. So separation from the world good relationships, and then personal communion with Christ. He was a dependent man, spending time in prayer, three times per day. He was, he was threatened, suffering or you die. What do you do? He continued. A man of prayer. And not only, and the last thing I will say, he had, he had a glorious perspective of the nation. He understood from the scriptures what the plans of God are with this nation. How about us? What is our perspective? Do we expect, do we wait for that moment when the man Christ Jesus will be glorified by God who will give him all things in heaven and all the things in earth? Honor to him. Are we waiting for that moment? Are we desire to be part of, a, of this company, of this vessel of testimony, who will be next to him and enhance that glory in the future. These are things real for us also. And I think that looking at, as we have heard at the conference, looking at our, how should I call them, people who live life of faith before us, we are encouraged that it is possible in a time of decline, general decline, not to be overcome, but to be an overcomer, to have that grace to rise above the general situation and to live a life for the glory of Christ and for the blessing of that person, but also of the people 
around us. May the Lord Jesus Christ give us the necessary grace to look at these kind of people, to understand these strategies, to keep our eyes on Christ, and to live life, victorious lives, for his glory that will come soon to take us home. Maybe may his name be glorified and uh, his heart was beating for us. Amen.